Hi there, everyone. Uh, welcome to, to tonight's event. Um, I'm Bob Cook. I'm the Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences here at Tufts. And it's great to see so many familiar faces and familiar names. And to welcome you to this uh, space where we can maybe take some time to process, learn, and think about uh, all the events that have happened of late, all of those that directly connect to long histories within the United States, and also maybe to think about uh, uh, all the transitions that are happening as we go forward. So um, I'm, I'm hopeful that we can sort of leave some of the concerns of, of just today, focus on, uh, on each other in this room, and to, to think more uh, together about who we are as uh, an institution and uh, how we can uh, move forward. So I'm gonna turn the event over to Jackie Jean, who is our Assistant Dean for Diversity, Equity, Inclusion. And she will introduce our speaker and give us a, an outline for what's gonna to happen tonight. Thanks, Bob. In his letter from a Birmingham jail, um, written April 16th, 1963, Dr. Martin Luther King wrote, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. On behalf of the GSAS and Tufts community gathered here today, I wanna to welcome our guest speaker, Dr. Nina Estrella Luna. I hope you all had a chance to read her bio. I myself, I've had the pleasure of getting to know Dr. Estrella Luna when she served as my uh, doctoral thesis advisor and research methods professor in the law and policy program at Northeastern University. She challenged, inspired, and championed all her students, but students of color and women saw her as a superhero in her advocacy for us and the reason we thrived and finished our programs. Dr. Sayaluna's commitment to the community um, of marginalized people is significant. And I want to thank my mentor and friend, Nina, for joining us today. Nina. You're muted. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Um, and it's always to be, it's always good to be in community, uh, especially in these times. Uh, before we begin, let us start as we always should uh, by recognizing that Tufts University is located in the traditional and unceded homelands of the Massa Echuaset and Pawtucket peoples, who had stewarded these lands for generations before their violent displacement by Europeans. And we must also recognize that this acknowledgement is merely a first step in disrupting the erasure and invisibility of our indigenous peoples and neighbors who are still with us today. We must call on each other and our government to respect and affirm tribal sovereignty and to work with tribal governments in the restoration, restitution and in land rematriation. So let's go ahead and begin, uh, get my screen up and hopefully you can see that. So good evening. I hope wherever you are, you are safe and that you are taking care of yourself. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here to provide some context for coming to grips with the siege on our nation's capital on January 6th. And at the most abstract level, uh, what we, can, we can definitely say that this falls under the heading of an uprising. Uh, but the question is, what kind of uprising? Uh, how do we think about the various ways in which groups of people make demands on a government, at least a government that is nominally a democratic system? Now, before we get to that, I think we have some foundational understanding uh, needed. We, we need to get to some foundational understanding about the free speech provisions in our constitution. Uh, th this is important because different forms of organized resistance and political resistance are protected political speech, but not every form of speech is protected. So, as you see here, the First Amendment of the US Constitution states, Congress shall make no law 
abridging the freedom of speech or the right of people to assemble peaceably or to petition the government for redress of grievances. And that petition part is important because it includes the right to protest law, policy, government practices, individual elected or appointed political officials. However, there are a few important things that we need to be very clear about what the First Amendment does and does not do. So first of all, what the First Amendment protects you from is interference by the government. It is, it is what we call, legal scholars call a negative right, which basically means you don't really have the right to speech or to assemble or to protest you have the right to be free from the government preventing your speech, assembly, or protest. Okay. Now, so second, as a consequence of that, the First Amendment doesn't protect consequences by private actors to your otherwise protected speech, assembly, and protest rights. Now, what that means is in, in reality, yes, you can be fired from your job unless you're protected by a union contract or a very, very strong employment contract. You can be removed from your school. You can be kicked off of Twitter because of your speech or protest actions, even in public institutions. Essentially, just because the government mostly cannot interfere with your right to speech, assembly, or protest, it does not mean that you are free from the consequences of those actions, of the speech that you make, the rallies that you participate in, the petitions that you sign. I myself had a friend uh, who was a teacher at a Catholic high school uh, down in Delaware many years ago. She was fired because she signed a petition that in support of Planned Parenthood, now she sued and the courts basically said, yep, they can do that because they can. Now, in general, the Supreme Court views spe free speech protections very expansively. They're, they're big on protecting speech rights, <clears throat> but there are important limitations to your free speech rights that go beyond the you can't shout fire in a uh, in a crowded theater, for example. And these include what you see here on the screen, defamation, threats, fighting words, uh, obscenity and child pornography, and of course, misleading uh, commercial speech. The Supreme Court has, uh, well, I should say, there's one other very, very relevant limitation to speech, uh, to your free speech rights. The Supreme Court has held that Advocacy of the use of force against the government is generally protected, except when it is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. So <clears throat> I present this because there's a lot of misunderstanding about what your free speech, legal free speech rights are and these free speech arguments have been weaponized over the past decade or so in order to discredit criticisms of or opposition to hate speech, to weaponize against criticisms around misinformation and disinformation campaigns. So in summary, if you leave here with nothing else, you have the right to free speech, you have the right to assemble peaceably, and you have the right to protest. You don't necessarily have the right to be free from the consequences of your speech or related actions. So with that taken care of, let's talk about the different ways in which people rise up against government, either government action or government inaction. So tonight we're gonna go through five different forms of dissent. Okay, so you can think of these as a typology that's roughly on a continuum of least radical to most radical action. So starting with the most acceptable, the least radical form of protest and dissent, we have petitions and rallies, right? So 
This has been part of Western tradition for hundreds of years, even you know, before the British colonies in North America. And as we just saw, the US Constitution has very strong rights to petition for the redress of your grievances. This includes holding rallies or demonstrations to persuade other people to your position. Keep in mind, because you that that you have a right to protest doesn't mean that your petition will necessarily be granted. What we see here on the screen is yet another petition submitted by, in this case, 86 black residents of the to the Boston School Committee in 1846, asking the Boston School Committee to desegregate the Boston public schools. Other cities and towns in Massachusetts had already done so. They're asking Boston to do the same. Now, in addition to petitions like this, there had been rallies, pamphlets had been printed and distributed, articles had been written in newspapers. There were other forms of political organizing around integrating Boston's public schools. Boston basically ignored decades of pleas to integrate their schools and they denied this, peti this petition as they did all of the others. So what this illustrates and why I bring this up is that the so-called ordinary avenues to redress real or perceived systemic injustice can easily be ignored or dismissed by those in power. So when the system fails to respond and speech alone fails to persuade, then people may need to step it up a notch to civil disobedience. I'm not gonna go into the history of civil disobedience. Uh, if you have questions about that, I'm happy to talk about that. What I wanna talk about is what is civil disobedience? Now, the least problematic description and definition for me at least is it is a principle and intentionally or at least knowingly on engagement in an unlawful act, usually as part of a social movement aimed at influencing or producing some social change. Now, that social change could be in law or policy or in institutions uh, to the extent that civil disobedience is aimed at consciousness raising. It could also be aimed at shaping a new understanding of our social contract. Uh, desired social change could also be a return to a past that people claim to have once existed. All of that could totally be found within various acts of civil disobedience. I personally like this definition because there's no political valence to it. One can engage in civil disobedience for progressive change or for regressive change. One can even engage in civil disobedience to prevent further social change. Whatever the goals are, those who are engaged in civil disobedience find that from their perspective, the normal channels of redressing grievances are just not working for them. And so they resort to civil disobedience as one tool of corrective persuasion. Now, let me give you a few examples of what that might look like. So, We've all seen, you know, the March on Washington and things like that. Let's let's look at some other kinds of examples. One of my favorites is about this incident, this uh, interesting experience uh, incident in uh, Brooklyn in 1964. So there was a civil rights organization called CORE. Their Brooklyn-based chapter attempted to organize what they called a stall in which is basically having their cars stall on the highway to the 1964 World, uh, World's Fair in New York City on its opening day. Now, their goal was to call attention to the racial injustices created or at least tolerated by New York City and other leaders. <clears throat> I, I think this is a fascinating story. When you have a chance, you should totally look it up. There's, a, there's been a, at least one or two books written about it. Uh, it's a great story in part because even though the action itself, the planned civil disobedience 
direct action itself actually didn't pan out. They, they thought thousands of cars were going to come and it didn't actually happen. But they did get way more media attention than they had been able to up to that point just by announcing and trying to organize the stall in. And they called attention to police brutality and job discrimination and the tolerance of dangerous housing conditions by the city's housing department and the grossly inequitable school system. In addition, other activists were able to actually get into the New York uh, World's Fair and essentially shame President Johnson and maybe perhaps influencing him to do more than he had otherwise planned to do on civil rights. Now, so I love that story. Totally go look it up, Google it out. Because do, do a Google of it because it's, it's, it's a fantastic story. Let's also remember though that not all civil disobedience is aimed at uh, progressive values. Consider uh, the acts of civil disobedience by anti-integration or anti-busing as well as anti-abortion activists. I myself have had personal experience with uh, anti-abortion activists blocking uh, my entry into a Planned Parenthood while I, uh, well, that I was trying to get into for my annual exam. So these happen. And then of course, more recently, the Black Lives Matter demonstrations, the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor demonstrations and rallies are the, more rec the most recent example of protest and to some extent civil disobedience. Now there's a lot that has been written in political theory and in the social sciences about civil disobedience. Uh, it may not be totally surprising to at least some of us that a lot of ink was spilled in the late 1960s into the early to mid 1970s as theorists tried to explore and explain. And really importantly, they spent a lot of time trying to justify the urban uprisings that were occurring in that period of time, especially the ones uh, that centered on Black and African-American communities. It should also maybe not be surprising for at least for some of us that very little of that ink was spilled looking at the various forms of civil disobedience by whites against people of color or by elites against subordinated social classes of all races. And that is actually one of, one of many sort, shortcomings in the political theorizing around civil disobedience. Most of it has focused on progressive social movement activism, almost none of it on conservative or regressive social movement activism. So there's a lot to say about the political, the evolution of political theory around civil disobedience, the phenomenon and the concept. We don't have time to get into all that tonight. Happy to answer any questions folks might have later on. Modern theorists do say, uh, or at least it's in my view, have done a very good job arguing that the conventional, especially academic conceptions of civil disobedience have many, many shortcomings. The one that I would like to talk about has to do with violence. So traditionally and actually in popular conception, political theorists and others argue that the only form of so-called legitimate civil disobedience are those that are nonviolent. And they say this in part because violence can be disproportionately or inappropriately or unduly coercive. That's a totally legitimate concern. However, one of the problems with this view is how do we conceive of violence? If you notice in this anti-busing protest here, the second on the left, busing itself is portrayed as violence against white people. Is it really? How broadly or how narrowly should we define violence when we think about civil disobedience? Is nonviolence solely the absence of physical harm to human beings? Does theft or looting, vandalism or property damage also count as violence? These are things that we need to think about. 
most people, especially today, would say yes to the theft and property damage counting as violence. I wanna give you a couple of examples to help us think this through and maybe problematize that just a little bit. So <clears throat> you may have heard about this one historical form of resistance to Southern slavery called the Underground Railroad. This is a map of what we know, at least of the Underground Railroad, uh, a lot of it went north, some of it went west. Uh, new, more research is now just beginning to happen on the, the Southern Underground Railroad that went into Mexico. Now, those who supported or participated in the Underground Railroad, they were morally opposed to slavery, so they had principles that were underlying their actions. And they were breaking several federal, and depending on the state they lived in, potentially state laws by assisting in the self-emancipation of enslaved peoples. The larger goal of the Underground Railroad was not just to assist specific individuals. It was also to raise the cost of enslavement as one part of a multi-pronged strategy to bring an end to slavery in the United States. But in the minds of many whites, both in the North and in the South, these individuals who were part of the Underground Railroad were engaged in or directly facilitating the theft of property, looting of a different kind. Is that violence? Here's another example. <clears throat> in the early 20th century, Mexicans from Juarez would cross into El Paso, Texas to work as domestics or in factories, as they had done really for generations. Now, starting sometime in 1916, a sanitizing, so-called sanitizing station was created at the border. All Mexicans passing through were required to strip down naked. They were doused in gasoline. They were sprayed with pesticides. And to complete the indignity for the women, um, they might have had their hair shaved off if a public in health inspector suspected lice. This was all in the service of trying to prevent the extremely low probability of a typhus epidemic in El Paso. They were forced to do this daily. It was also widely known that some of the inspectors and border patrol officers were taking photos of the nude women and posting them in a local bar. So finally, uh, on January 28th, 1917, one woman had had enough. Her name is Carmelita Torres. I totally recommend uh, also Googling her because it's a fantastic story. So she basically said, no mas. She convinced 30 other women initially to refuse the gasoline baths. Within an hour, 200 more women blocked the bridge into El Paso. A border patrol officer tried to force them to comply. They threw a rock at him and they cut his cheek, poor guy. Even General Francisco Murgias, his squadron of death, and that is actually what they called him, he came in trying to quell the protest, totally failed. His squadron of death ended up leaving completely humiliated by the hundreds of women who ridiculed and even attacked the Mexican soldiers. However, <clears throat> after a couple of days, eventually the police in Juarez dispersed the protesters. A lot of people were arrested, including some of the leadership. Some things changed and some things did not. Partly because of the pressure from employers and the families with those Mexican servants who refused to submit to this indignity, um, they changed the rules. Mexicans only had to submit to disinfection once a week at most, and the US authorities agreed to accept health certificates from the Mexican public health authorities. Sadly, what did not change is the inspection and disinfection requirements. At some point in the 1920s, health officials started using Zyklon B, 
that pest as, as a pesticide, which if you don't know, was the chemical, the primary chemical used in the Nazi gas chambers. Later on, they switched to DDT. This, the baths did not end until the 1960s. So there was civil disobedience and it had limited effect. Now notice, however, that this act of civil disobedience is described as a riot. And here is where things get tricky. In general, a riot is characterized as a spontaneous, unplanned group violence. They most frequently involve property damage and vandalism, there's looting, those are the, the three most common things that you see in a riot. Riots can arise when nonviolent civil disobedience or the standard channels of change, social change, fail to persuade or fail to result in any meaningful change. Not all riots are rooted in subjugation. The social science research has found that uprisings by people of color and other marginalized groups, the ones at least that are described as riots, they are always rooted in a history of oppression and subjugation, and then there's a catalyzing, precipitating incident. The overwhelming majority of those precipitating incidents involve police abuse of power. Now that's the pattern for people of color and other marginalized groups. The patterns for whites are different. There are two forms of rioting that whites in the US have historically engaged in. For most of the recent history, these would be sports riots and other similar incidents of destruction and mayhem like the 2014 pumpkin festival riot in New Hampshire. I tried to find a picture of that, but I couldn't find a good one that I, had the, I could get the legal rights to at least. I personally have not read any or found really any scholarship on the underlying social psychological factors that explain the sports and similar riots that white people tend to engage in. Um, what generally the scholarship generally focuses on are the is the role that white privilege plays in the aftermath or at least in how they're portrayed and how law enforcement treats white people or white riots in the aftermath of a sports game compared to how people of color engaged in nonviolent demonstrations are treated uh, and portrayed. So that's one thing. Now, the other common form of rioting by whites is well studied and is part of a longer history and a longer historical pattern. And that is white mob riots engaged in rape, racial violence, which also includes lynching. Prior to the 1960s, if you read, a, a pay, uh, read about a riot in a newspaper, it was almost always describing a white mob attacking a person or community of color. And in fact, it may not even be totally accurate to call all of those incidents a riot because many of them were not spontaneous. Many of them were actually planned and had the blessing and, and potentially the support of the local leadership and local law enforcement. So these riots, these white mob riots, almost always are rooted in racial resentment. Uh, especially the resentment of the improving social and economic status of people of color, especially black people. Ida B. Wells documented over the course of many decades that most targets of lynching in the South, those mob riots that happened in the South, were targeting people who were viewed as challenging white supremacy or the white supremacist privilege by those black folks becoming successful business owners or getting elected. Now, with that said, white riots are definitely not confined to the South. That is something that we really have to get out of our heads. Over the course of the 20th century in particular, white mob riots were as frequent in the North and in the West as they were in the South and as they continue to be. With the exception of white mob violence, which is really about social control. Most forms of civil disobedience are aimed at changing either law or policy, 
or changing the hearts and minds of the public or the leadership or oftentimes both. Inherent in any form of protest is a critique of the institutions and the systems that created the perceived wrong or injustice. People are always saying when they engage in civil disobedience, this needs to be changed. This is a problem that needs to be addressed. Now with most forms of civil disobedience, especially the nonviolent uh, forms, the, the goal generally is to improve our institutions, improve our systems. Even the calls to abolish a system are really about creating something new, replacing the old with something that works better or to make them operate in ways that better conform to the values of the folks engaged in the, civil dis the act of civil disobedience. So that's when, when we're talking about civil disobedience, most of the time, that's what people want. They want change. When we get to insurrection, we're in a whole different game. First, I think it's important to acknowledge that the United States of America was created through rebellion and insurrection. That is a part of our history. We have to be honest about that. And pretty shortly after the Treaty of Paris was signed in, 18, in 1783, uh, which brought an end to what we now call the Revolutionary War, the US government passed laws prohibiting rebellion and insurrection. So current federal law prohibits the incitement, <clears throat> assistance, or engagement in the revolt against the authority of the US government. These are federal crimes. I will say this again, inciting, assisting, or engaging in the revolt against the authority of the US government is a federal crime in addition to fines and potential imprisonment, anyone convicted under this law would also never be able to hold any elected or appointed political office. They would also, under separate laws, be, uh, they would also forfeit any retirement benefits they may otherwise be entitled to. <clears throat> now, here's the truth. However, the Department of Justice rarely uses this law, and not because it hasn't because we haven't had insurrections. I uh, spent a good chunk of yesterday searching for a case. I couldn't find a single case when I looked this up. I will admit, um, I didn't do the deepest of searches, uh, but everything that I've read so far has said that this statute is quote unquote rarely used, which is basically code by academics and responsible journalists who really say, yeah, it's probably never been used. So, from a legal perspective, if you are interested in accountability for an insurrection, then seditious conspiracy is the way to go. Seditious conspiracy is basically conspiring to overthrow the government or to prevent by force the implementation or the execution of a law, which could include, for example, the counting of certified electoral college votes. Now this statute has actually been used. However, it hasn't been very successful, actually it hasn't been successful at all as far as I could find in the prosecution of white nationalist or white supremacist conspiracies to overthrow the government. That's not to say the Department of Justice hasn't tried it just hasn't been successful. Now that might change. One thing I do wanna make clear before we move forward um, is, cause this has come up a lot um, in the last couple of weeks, there's a difference between sedition and treason. Sedition is basically conspiracy in service of an insurrection. Treason is the only crime actually defined in the US constitution. And what that's basically about is 
the betrayal of the loyalty to the US government. If you are a US citizen, you are expected to be loyal to the US government. So treason is basically a betrayal of that loyalty on behalf of an enemy. And for the most part in general, the, when we think about enemies, we're thinking about foreign governments, at least that's traditionally how it's been thought of. Now, this is how we get to coup, because this is the last form of resistance to government. What is a coup? In general, most scholars define a coup as the removal of an existing government from power, usually through violence, and the seizure of that power by a political faction or the military or a dictator. <clears throat> we have no laws about coups in the United States. And in fact, uh, I was looking up in some of the US legal dictionaries that I have uh, access to, couldn't find that word at all in it. Uh, I did find them in British legal dictionaries. I did not find it in US legal dictionaries. In general, an attempted coup would essentially under a current law would have to be considered an insurrection or sedition. With the exception of the secession of the Southern states in 1860 and 1861, which led to the Civil War, there have been no attempts to violently overthrow the US government in a seditious way, uh, at least none that were even remotely close to successful. When political factions in the United States want to take over, what they do is they create legal structures to make it look like their seizure of power was within the bounds of a democratic process. So things like poll taxes or literacy tests or uh, voter ID requirements. At the federal levels though, coups haven't been really a thing. And some people like to believe that because coups haven't been a thing at the federal level in the United States, well, that happens because we are so exceptional. Like we are, those kinds of things just couldn't happen here. The truth is it has happened here. It has happened in the United States. We have had coups, violent coups in the past. The most uh, famous example of that is the Wilmington insurrection in 1898. So for those of you who have never heard of this, Essentially what happened is members of the Democratic Party, which remember in 1898, at that time, the Democratic Party was the party of overt white supremacy. They were, pre they were previously the party of slavery. So members of the Democratic Party in North Carolina led a mob of about 2000 people to violently overthrow the white and black elected officials who had been legitimately elected to the city government in 1898. They then replaced those appropriately legitimately elected officials that they ran out of town with Democrats who were not elected. Businesses and homes were destroyed. This is one of them that you see here. Um, estimates vary between 60 and 300 people were killed. We do know that hundreds and uh, potentially thousands of folks were eventually displaced. They were literally run out of town. So we're not that exceptional. Coups have happened here. They will probably happen again. So how then do we think about uprisings and rebellions? There are three questions that I think might guide us. The first question would be, what are the motivations of the various actors, especially the ones leading, inciting, and as particularly important, funding the uprising? What are their goals? Are they trying to improve our fragile and imperfect democracy? Or are they attempting to overturn an election? Second, Separate from their publicly professed aims, what are the values of the actors involved? Every social movement, will you will find that there is a diversity of motivations and there's a diversity of values. What are those values? And are those values consistent with our legal and social ideals? 
maybe not necessarily our actual, how things actually are, but where we're always aiming to get to. And then finally, are the actions of, of the folks in these uprisings, are they constructive or destructive? And I know I'm not talking about what it looks like in terms of an action, direct action incident and a, you know, a, a civil disobedience or a, a march or whatever. I'm talking about what, if the demands are met, what would be gained and what would be lost? And who would gain what and who would lose what? These are things that I think should direct our analysis of any uprising and to help us make sense of what is going on. So as I have reflected on the January 6th siege of our nation's capital, it seems clear to me that one, it cannot be called a civil dis an act of civil disobedience. Uh, even when you acknowledge that civil disobedience can be motivated by conservative or regressive goals, the capital siege was not an act of civil disobedience. It also cannot be called a riot in that it was clearly planned violence. If it is a riot, it is only so in the sense of the white mob riots that we've seen throughout our nation's histories, right? The riots that we, by the way, have ignored or tried to erase. So in my view, when I think about what happened on January 6th, it is clearly an insurrection. It was clearly an attempted coup. And the evidence is growing every day um, that there was a seditious conspiracy to plan and incite it. This is, why is this important? Is a legitimate question. To me, this is important because if we do not call it what it is, then we risk the danger of erasing history again. If we do that, if we erase what happened and call it something else, try to excuse it, we will yet again miss the opportunity to strengthen our fragile and imperfect democracy. Which means that even if they were not successful this time, they may be next time. So I wanna thank you for the opportunity to uh, share our, my thoughts on this. Um, we are going to do Q&A a little bit differently uh, than some of you might have done before. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you have questions and that's fantastic. Now, many of us go to conferences or talks where we only hear questions or comments from those people who felt the urgency to talk because they've had to stay quiet for half an hour and I need to say something. Um, and sometimes we get really good questions from that and sometimes we don't. <clears throat> Here's what we're gonna do. Uh, let's see, how much time do we have? Oh, good. We're gonna give each other, we're gonna give you about 20 minutes to talk with each other. We're gonna put you into breakout rooms and what I ask, wanna ask you to do is to peer review your questions. So, You'll see an invitation on your screen in, in just a minute to join your fellows in a breakout room. If you don't have any questions right now, that's okay. Talk about what you're taking away. Uh, how does this help you understand what happened and what's going on? What new things have you learned? And a question might arise from that conversation. For those of you who think you have a conversation, share that with your fellow breakout room participants. Um, someone, uh, what I would ask you is that Pick the one question that you really want to have answered in, from your group. Um, do make sure in your 20 minutes that there is that the question that you're posing is really a question, one that ends in a question mark. It's not a rhetorical question. Right? It's not a question that answers itself or a question that's masquerading as a statement, um, or it's a statement masquerading as a question. Make sure that it's a question that is intended to explore and not necessarily to challenge 
the correctness or the morality or the logic of a group of people. And then make sure that that's a question that can be that that can be asked or needs to be asked and can be answered in this space. So I think we're going to give you about 20 minutes, I believe, to to do this, and then we'll come back together. And when we come back together, I'll ask each group to pose one question in the chat. So make sure that you identify who's going to do that, and then I'll do my best to answer. <laughs> 